Ian be fearful though because it is I own. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the September 12, 2006 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. If we could stand for the allegiance. Approval of the June school board minutes. You're in your packet. Thank you, Kevin. Is there a second? Thank you, Kathy. Any comments? I'd just like to thank uh, my executive secretary for taking over that evening because I was out ill and I understand things went well. And I asked her if she'd do it tonight, but she decided she'd prefer not to. So <laughs> I'll let her do it in October instead. Mary did a great job, and she did a great yeah. job with the recognition of the teachers, too, because she certainly brought a, a nice touch to that. So I agree. Thank you, Mary. Um, <coughs> all those in favor accepting the minutes? 7 0. We have adjustments to the agenda. Um, are there any? I, do, I have a couple under the superintendent's report. Could you add as D, discussion about kindergarten at Pond Cove? Uh, under E, a brief, just a very brief overview of what we've done in changing the substitute plan for this year within the school system. And F would be the selection of the uh, celebrating school people uh, who will be participating this year in that program. And I'll just go over that briefly as well. Thank you. Any other adjustments? Okay. Uh, communications. Uh, item number A, a letter from Soccer Boosters regarding reimbursement money for Soccer Shed. I will mention that in your packets there is a letter uh, dated August 23rd from Martha Palmer about the Soccer Shed and the destruction of it. And then there is an update uh, that came to you also. I'm looking for a date. There's one on it. No, there isn't. Uh, but I think, uh, Rebecca, you're going to uh, report on our meeting at this point in time. Sure. Um, we uh, had a meeting, the Finance Committee met with uh, Martha Jeff Heath regarding um, this snack shack and insurance reimbursement. Um, I did forward to you today the minutes from that meeting, but I'll just briefly go over it. The, um, we basically met to obtain a more in-depth understanding of the history of the Snack Shack and the issues involved. Um, Keith Weatherby reiterated that the soccer boosters paid to build the shack, paid for its upkeep through the years, and that the school district's contribution was um, basically keeping it under its umbrella insurance plan. Ms. Palmer shared that the shed was vandalized um, basically each year, and each year the soccer boosters repaired and replaced damaged equipment or any infrastructure. The soccer boosters do not plan on paying to replace the shed themselves. Rather, there is discussion with other booster groups to jointly work together to locate and deliver a donated shed. In addition, there is a prospect of the larger, newer concession stand should the turf field be installed. Um, she did make some changes to the estimate for replacing the ninth grade JV uniform, um, which I think all of you got. I'm hoping you did. And um, I did ask the question at the meeting whether the school district pays for uniforms traditionally, and they um, both um, Keith and um, Alan confirmed that that was the case. So uh, I don't know, is this the place where we're going to discuss this, or when are we doing it? You can certainly ask questions, I would imagine. OK. Do you have any more questions for me or for Jeff and Keith? I have a question for Jeff and Keith, I think. When was the last time we replaced JV uniforms? JV soccer uniform? Yep. Um, I can't remember the last time we did. What we, um, 
we normally do is when we buy um, varsity uniforms, the uniforms or the varsity uniforms move down to become JV uniforms. Okay, so that's really the standard process, is the handing down process that's been in place forever. Right. Okay. And Keith, while you're right there, I think there was another piece to that question. Was the loss of some uniforms two years ago? Uh, yeah. And the question about that. In the transition from uh, where we were located during the course of the year, our office was moved four times. And in the process of moving from one location to another location, we lost uh, a whole set of JV lacrosse uniforms. And during the uh, during that time, the soccer boosters bought T-shirts for the kids to wear, uh, and we have never been able to locate those lost uniforms and the movement from one location to another. I just wanted to clarify what we're really being asked to do here. Are we just reviewing the letter that Martha Palmer submitted, or are we being asked to maybe move this to an action item to make a decision on what should happen to the funds? From, from my perspective as a superintendent, this is a very rare occurrence where you have something that, like a building on the grounds that was burned and you receive insurance, and so what do you do with it at that point in time? Mm -hmm. uh, based on the letters that I had received, both letters, uh, contacted Jeff and contacted Keith to talk with them about it. My sense is, is that I have got to have some direction as far as where that money goes. You can do that by giving me direction to manage it, or you can do that by taking action upon it as far as how you want it spent. My understanding in, in the conversations that I've had with people is some questions about how the money should be spent appropriately. Uh, the question of replacing the building seems not to be a question that's out there. So the questions that I had were the questions of who actually owns it and has used the building over and over again. Very clearly, the school department has insured it because it's on public school property. So, so your, the answer to your question, Ian, is that I'm looking for some direction as far as how we do this. Again, a very rare instance. I've tried to find out from other places what they've done, and there's not an awful lot of information out there because they haven't somebody had somebody burn down their building. And so it really comes down to the question of, are we going to build a new building, which I'm hearing no because of what Turf is talking about? Can the money be used to purchase soccer uniforms? Can, I, can that be directed that way? Does it get to redirect it to the money goes to the athletic department and make decisions from there? Can it be used for other things, et cetera? And I think I, I sent out to all of you today uh, six questions which I think were important as far as understanding the ownership of the building, and those are, uh, was it placed on the field by the soccer boosters? Did it belong exclusively to, exclusively to the soccer boosters and used specifically by them to raise funds to support soccer? The building Was the building maintained by the soccer boosters? Is, what, we know the building was insured by the school department because of the legal ramifications there. There was a loss of uniforms about two years ago uh, during asbestos removal and the moving of offices, and there is no plan to build a replacement building using insurance money. So therefore, how do we use that money? Does it set an account? Does it get distributed? How do we go about that is, is where I see the issue. And again, it's an issue that you can either turn back over to me to make some decisions, or you can give some guidance as far as where you want it to go. Again, whole new issue, so mm -hmm. that's how we need to deal with it. Okay, thanks. Question for the chair. If, since we're discussing it now, is now the appropriate time to make a motion, or should we wait until new business? If someone would like to make a motion to make this an action item under new business, I would take that motion now. I move to make this an action item under new business. And can you... Uh, well, is there a second? Second it. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I think we need some wording on that motion. Sure. You want it now or under new bit? That was the primary question. Do you want the wording now? I, yeah, I would like to have the wording oh, now. Sure. As part of the discussion before the vote. I move that we delegate or authorize the superintendent to distribute the money based on his um, fact finding. 
Any other adjustments to that? I'll second that one as well. <laughs> you second that wording. You get that, Mary? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor of the uh, adjustment to the agenda with the wording as provided by Kevin? That'd be 7 0. Move on to item number B uh, MSMA accidental mm -hmm. death and dismemberment insurance for school board members. We're all in receipt of that. And <laughs> if you'd like to take advantage of that, I, uh, paperwork is there. And that is basically what you have is the paperwork to show you that uh, this has been offered. Uh, we are to provide each of you the photocopy of that and I need to go back to Pauline for just a minute. Pauline, do I need to have a vote on this or is it just to show that they have the information? Okay, so this is just an informational piece. And that's already accomplished, isn't it? Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jack. Do so we do not fill this out and give it to you? Do you need them to fill out the, the back? And you can put me on if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> this is a benefit, unknown it's to all of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> you undervalue yourself. Because it only pays if you watch school board business. Oh. That's right. Oh. <laughs> well. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. I will be traveling to pass on the 21st. Okay. Uh, item number C, we'll move to, and Alan, the letters of resignation. What I have done is, just for the public to understand, during the summer months when the board doesn't vote and doesn't meet, what they have given me the uh, right to do is to hire staff and also accept resignations. Then in September, what I need to do is read these to the board so that they get involved, be, get put in your minutes so there is an official uh, uh, recognition of that happening. So what I'm going to do tonight is I have some here. I'm just going to mention them briefly and just ask for your acceptance. <coughs> the first one is from Ann Willett, uh, who uh, has resigned her position as half-time educational technician to at Pond Cove Elementary School uh, to move on to something else. The second one you have in front of you is from Doug Maker. Doug was a person who we hired uh, early, uh, late spring to do science at Cape Elizabeth High School, Middle School. Uh, shortly thereafter, he got an offered a science position in the high school where he lives, and he came to me and asked if he could resign at that point in time. I did let him do that. We have hired somebody else to take his place. So his is a resignation, somebody we hired and never gave one cent to. So it's just uh, to do it that way. Those are the only two resignations that I have at this point. But just, I need to make them officially a part of your record. Elaine, yes. a tenuous point of information. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Didn't we already authorize Alan to accept resignations without a vote of the school board? Yes. Yeah, it's it's just, just, we, we don't need to vote, so yeah. we're just acknowledging. Just to put them in the record, so okay. Mary requires them. Good. Yep. Uh, we'll move to item number D, field trip requests. The first one that I have for you is from David Weatherby. And this is for Stanford Cross Country Invitational. I'd let you know this a while ago. This came very quickly and needed to be accepted very quickly so that uh, I could manage this. This is basically uh, that uh, his uh, cross country, yeah, cross country, I call them champions. The, the leaders of his group have been invited to Stanford Cross Country Invitational at Palo Alto, California. Uh, they depart here on Thursday, September 28th at 3.30 from Manchester, New Hampshire. We'll fly to uh, Oakland and then on to Palo Alto where they will participate. And then we'll fly back here on Sunday, uh, whatever the Sunday is, and be back in school on Monday. The total cost of the trip is $5,030. However, almost all of those costs have been taken care of by other agencies so that the only cost to students is $120 each and has to pay for some meals while they're out there. Uh, again, when David got this to me, we had to take some fast action. Uh, so what I did was to contact you to see if this fits within our board policy. We already had practice of this last year, and so we had done that. And so what I need to do tonight is just so you will formalize acceptance uh, of this trip. Now, this leads to a problem. <laughs> and the problem is this. We are in the process of doing new policy. New policy would have allowed me to do this on my own, but since that policy has not been passed yet, the question to the board is, 
should you be voting to approve it or do I go ahead and approve it? And then that same question will come up with several others. Uh, do you want me to stop at that one and then go on to the others mm -hmm. and make a decision on that? Well, and you got a copy of the old policy. Is this within the? Well, actually, under the old policy, we had two different policies. One was athletic policy, and one was other field trips. And so under the new one, what we've done is we've combined both of those and really greatly expanded what that policy would cover. And so now it's all one student travel and field trip. So it does get pretty complicated. But And actually, I pulled out the, the field trip policy, but I could get the I mean, I, Mary gave me the athletic trip policy, but I mean, the question, you know, would pertain to all three of these field trips presented tonight because it, the decision making process is really different depending on whether we go on our current or our, what's going to probably be proposed at the October meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we need to follow, I believe we need to follow the old one because the new one hasn't been approved by the board, unfortunately. Yep. And, and, and based on, I know that we, we approved in June the preliminary request for the Costa Rica trip based on the old policy um, and then tabled the new policy and that work hasn't been completed yet. So I would support going by the old policy. Which would or would not allow this trip? Would allow. Okay. Based on that, I think we should probably take a vote on each one separately. Yep. That's why I thought we'd better stop at each one. Um, and since we, and, and that is under new business uh, consideration of this trip here, so we can have that vote later on. The other two field trip requests are preliminary requests, my right. understanding, for the French exchange program. Can mm -hmm. I discuss yep. that? and the board can uh, decide what to do with those. The second request is from David Peary, who is a high school French teacher, requesting approval of full student exchange for the school in France in the 2006-2007 school year. A uh, trip would be coordinated uh, through an agency there as an exchange program. Uh, the trip in total would be three weeks. One of those weeks would be during uh, the vacation week. Uh, the other two weeks is when they would be in schools visiting schools, visiting the area, et cetera. I think this is a type of trip that I know my daughters in another school system did this at one point. Uh, all costs uh, mentioned in the request along with transportation, accommodations, et cetera. You all have dealt with David before and know he's done these trips before and has done an excellent job with them. Uh, he has checked and all of the issues that I usually bring up have been covered as far as insurance coverage and all of those pieces. I would be inclined to approve the trip, but I do have one question yep. I'd like to hear answered, and that is why three weeks rather than two? I probably will have to go to Jeff for that, but my understanding is, why is it three weeks instead of two? And it, it, has this been common practice with these, Jeff? I think that's been the standard that David has done since I've been here. It's been three weeks. Three weeks? I don't think, um, well. I think so. I may be wrong. My, my impression is two weeks, yeah. uh, and I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I, I can just share that last year's trip, which was the exchange program with uh, Mark Pendarvis for the Costa Rican students, the students came over and stayed with us about two weeks, but our students were closer to three weeks. Um, um, so just to ask a quick question. Yeah. Trip. yeah. Just out of curiosity, when he, this teacher is gone, who takes his class? Do you hire a sub to do that? Yes, we do. Okay. Any, any further questions on the proposed trip? Okay. And the third trip is, uh, this is from Lisa Mel Mel Melanson and Hannah Jones, chaperoning a trip to England during April vacation. What they, what they basically have to request is that they be allowed to miss a day of school, Monday, April 23rd, which is the day we will start school after vacation. So what I need is the approval for them to use that day. So those are the three field trip, uh, trip ones that I have this evening. 
At, at this time, is there any further action required of the board um, on those last two requests? Meaning that since we will have a new policy and we'll be voting on this at another time, um, we're just giving uh, the go, we usually just give the go ahead for them to conduct student meetings or any type of fundraising that goes along with it. They can start that. Absolutely. That would be the second and third ones. The first one, I do need the final approval right. on. Yep. All right. Any further questions on those field trips? Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, item number E is a NEASC report update that is in our packet, and this was a uh, corrected letter that came from the New England Association of Schools and Colleges uh, to our administrators regarding the um, uh, recommendations and the uh, more information on the high schools receiving a NEASC. Credit. Accreditation. Accreditation yes. Jeff, Excuse do you me. have specifics on this that you want to mention as far as changes are concerned? Um, there's, there's really only one change on it, and it has to do with the date that the high school has to prepare a special report, submit a, re a special report to NEASC. There was a clerical error in the original letter that came to the high school. It said that the special report directed to the curriculum issue was originally scheduled to be turned in on in January of 2008 and that was a mistake and in the summer Janet Allison from NIAS called me and said we made a mistake um, would it be okay to, to put it January 2007 or given where you are now are you relying so heavily on January 2008 that you need additional time and I said Janet it's not a problem we're working on it. Um, we've been working on it even before the NIAS team left. Um, and I would, we'd just as soon get the work over with and get it out to you and um, take care of all that. So, so they sent out that corrected uh, letter. It's, in other respects, identical to the letter that we received before. Okay. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> I have some questions about this because for some reason this is the first time I've seen this letter. Um, or first time I actually read the whole thing. Uh, um, it goes beyond curriculum uh, as outlining some areas that need to be worked on. So in particular, I was surprised to see a reference to full-time nurse. Um, and if there wasn't going to be a full-time nurse, how we're going to meet the health services to, uh, of the students. Um, what else? Uh, including a special education, this is about curriculum, but I wasn't sure if we were doing this, including special education faculty in the curricular process, and do we have that? It, let, me, let me clarify. Okay. The only change between the last letter and this letter was the date for the report on curriculum. The special report that we're required to give deals only with the curriculum issue. As with any NIAS report, there are always lots and lots of recommendations in a report that um, that the New England Association gives out to high schools and that's just standard operating procedure and then it's up to the school to give regular progress reports, regularly scheduled progress reports on all of the recommendations in the report but paying particular attention to one, the ones that they've highlighted in this letter. It doesn't mean that we need to do everything in that letter. It means that we need to either do it or develop a plan to do it or say to them, we, we don't think, we, don't, we disagree with your interpretation, but we have to give a report. All high schools have to give a report within two years after a visit, within five years after a visit, and then within 10 years after a visit. Sometimes you're required to give special reports, as we had been doing at the high school, for example, ever since I've been here to address the um, ADA accessibility issues at the high school that were solved by the renovation. So, the, but the only change in this letter, so this is that those kinds of things that are spelled out in letters are very, very, very common. Um, they're dealt with in more length in the, the long report that I think all the board members got um, last right. year. But, uh, but I think, you know, just to take one example is the nursing situation. I think the question they're asking is a logical one. With a school the size of Cape Elizabeth High School, and even if they're looking at the middle school and Pond Cove, 
the questioning of whether we have enough nursing services to meet the standard. And so I think that's why that goes in there, and that's why Jeff and his committee have to take a look at that and make some recommendations for it. I think that, that that's getting at what I really wanted to address, which is um, at what point do we at the, as the school board get to hear how your, the administration plans on responding to these various recommendations? My sense is you would be reporting back to the board anyway. Yeah, I mean, some of those, if there would be as part of the regular budget process, where there are budgetary implications to things, we can schedule a meeting if you'd like. My preference would be what I've told the school, this high school staff, is that right now we are focusing, quite frankly, single mindedly on the curriculum issue. Once we get that one behind us, we will begin to focus um, more on the others. The school nursing situation certainly will come up I'm, again, I'm sure, in, in some respects in the budget process. And it says it's looking for the first two year progress report on October 1st, 2007. Is that right? The, the special progress report, I thought it was. Now this is, uh, all accredited schools must submit a required two-year progress report, which in the case of Cape Elizabeth High School is due on October 1st, 2007. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I was thinking this was 2007. Yes, that's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you scared me for a second. <laughs> so we have some time. Then. Yes, we do have some time. The one, the one that's on the fast track right now is the curriculum work that we have to produce a report for by January of this, right. a few months from now. Okay, thanks. Does that, that help? Okay. Yeah. And, and then at, at some point I would love somebody to translate for me the paragraph that's indented on page three. And it's not now, but it, it, it goes on and on about prioritized learning outcomes with attendant common assessments and rubrics at the ex academic expectations, blah, 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 blah. And I, for the life of me, could not decipher what that meant. So could you take a look at it and just kind of translate it for us? At an appropriate when time, whenever you'd like, that would be fine with me. I'll, when we I'll get give the report it. back, we can have that in-depth analysis. I will give it the best shot I can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Also in our packet uh, this evening was the annual report uh, from our volunteer coordinator, Gail Schma Schmader. Um, would you like to talk to yes. us, Alex? I, I would just comment is, uh, this is my second year here. In case you have noticed, I'm no longer the new superintendent. <laughs> uh, and what I would say to you is, uh, Gail Schmader is an amazing, amazing person in the work she does in the school system. And what she does annually is to provide you a report of all of the different uh, things that she is doing. Uh, the report's fascinating. I read it last year. I read it again this year. I'm not going to take you through it tonight in a step-by-step -step basis. But I think it is very important to recognize the fact that you have a person who, for a very limited amount of money, it does some amazing things in this system as far as volunteering is concerned. And if you look at the number of hours she gets out of the volunteers, it is, it is amazing. Uh, and I don't think any of you question it if you're in buildings. Most of you are in buildings at one point or another as volunteers, so you know that. And we have just a wonderful cadre of people who volunteer on a very regular basis in our schools. So I think from perspective of the board, I would hope that uh, I can take back to Gail uh, your thanks to her for, for her hard work over the past year. I would just like to say, I think that, that certainly, as you said, Alan, the, one of the great strengths of our school system is in our volunteers, in our parent volunteers, and all the volunteers that do other things in our school system. And I, I do want you to take back to Gail that we appreciate the report, um, the thoroughness of it, the graphs, the, um, and the content. I appreciate that. And I'm sure she put a lot of time into it. So thank you to her. At this point, uh, we are at the um, comments for the public on non-agenda items. If anyone would like to speak at the podium, they may so do so at this time. Elaine, well, I have one. Oh, you want to take it there or at the podium? No, thank you. I, I'm <laughs> quite happy, and it looks like there's no microphone up there. But... Okay. In any event, um, two communications. One is that on... Um, September 21st of this month, there will be a meeting of the General Advisory Committee um, at Portland Technical High School. I've already invited Dominic, uh, our new Director of Special Services, pending Allen's and his calendars, 
Alan is usually there as a member of that committee, but I would also like to inv uh, invite one member of the board who might be free from noon to roughly 2 o'clock, although we, we have a habit of break getting out of there a half hour early. Um, the offset to the boring business is a very good lunch prepared by the student culinary folks and um, much better than the dining hall lunches I've been having for the last few weeks. That's that. The other item is um, on behalf of myself as well as the other candidates for school board and the candidates for town council. We have agreed as a group that we will not be using campaign signs this year and cluttering up the highways and byways of Cape Elizabeth with an additional 100 or 200 signs, um, frames, and other things that are basically eyesores and get in the way. Um, it's an environmentally sound move as well, and so do not expect to see any signs from the candidates for council or school board. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, I'll move on to recognition. And I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to both thank and to congratulate. On August 29th at our opening day teachers assembly and on August 31st, which was the first day of school, the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation made some special presentations for two annual teacher awards that recognized the work of exemplary teachers and staff within our community. These award recipients will receive a commemorative glass apple, a cash award of $2,000, and of course the honor of being recognized. I'd like to first thank CIF for making part of their mission the goal of recognizing these teachers and their efforts. In Cape Elizabeth, we are lucky to have many outstanding teachers who go above and beyond their job descriptions day after day. If you ask any student, parent, or peer, they can tell you Many of them have made positive differences in our students' lives beyond simply learning. So thank you first to C for establishing these awards and for their help in creating the type of culture that celebrates excellence in teaching. The first award that they uh, awarded was named the Brownell Award after Elaine Brownell, many of whom we know, is a longtime math teacher at our high school and a five-year educational advisor for the foundation. Her dedicated work from the first days of CIF's existence to her outstanding teaching in the classroom have been aptly recognized by this honor. The Brownell Award will go to staff for outstanding use of a CIF grant. And this year's award has gone to Evan Thayer for his work in creating a high school, middle school, and now Pond Cove after school program in robotics. Evan's enthusiasm to expose students to engineering experiences has reached students across many grade levels. While the CIF grant to fund this robotics program went primarily for the starter kits, it was also the time that was given by Evan and other volunteers that helped to make this program such a success. At the presentations, Evan thanked others who helped launch the program, including a retired engineer and volunteer, Eric Jensen, and a Cape Elizabeth High School student, Connor Dodd. I'm sure our fellow school board members join me in congratulating Evan in this special recognition. The second CIF award was established to recognize an individual who goes above and beyond the call of duty in the life of a student in Cape Elizabeth. In honor of Cape Elizabeth graduate Timmy Thompson, this annual award has been called the Thompson Award. In a moving introduction, Nancy and Tim Thompson announced the first recipient as Ben Raymond. Ben has worked at Cape Elizabeth High School for 10 years as an ed tech and now as a special education teacher, along with coaching multiple sports over the years. As the Thompsons described Ben's qualities that earned him this special recognition, they stated Ben knew Timmy as a teacher, coach, and most importantly, as a friend. Our congratulations go to Ben on this very special honor. I know our community of teachers, parents, and students will find both Evan Thayer and Ben Raymond to be inspirational to future recipients. And thanks once again to Steve for helping to recognize these special teachers. 
can move along to the superintendent's report. Uh, the first report I have is on the opening of school. Uh, as Elaine said, our first day with full staff was on the 29th of August. Uh, we had a full staff meeting at the high school in the cafeteria, the first time that's been done. Uh, we had a full, a room full of people. We had what I considered a uh, really exciting opening day with some nice presentations, for, first from Seif, and then we also had people come in uh, from uh, honoring uh, school people and talking about the process that they're going through. We really took a look at the, the fact that we need to remember that we all do the job of making sure students get the very best education they can. Uh, I am not a believer in having workshops on those days because I know teachers are getting back, they're anxious to work in their rooms, etc. So once we finish, uh, they use the day before with some schools and that afternoon and the next day to get their rooms ready and also to meet with their principals. We actually started physically with students in the buildings on Wednesday of that week when we brought the ninth graders in. Uh, they were the only ones in the city, that, uh, town, that came to school. Uh, I didn't hear too many protests, so that was nice. And they got a chance to get introduced to the high school on that day. The next day, all students from grades 1 through 12 attended school. Uh, again, I was uh, with Sue Weatherby and Pauline Portria, and we stood out at the end of Jordan Way and made sure cars went where they were supposed to go and made sure kids got where they had to go at the same time. If you'll also remember, uh, there had been an incident earlier in the week where a child was stopped at home by somebody driving a white truck. There was some serious concerns about that. So we were also there to make sure that any questions that needed to be answered were answered, to make sure that the television crews were not there asking questions about what was going on, et cetera. Uh, we had a very smooth start. I did have a chance to go to the high school that morning. Uh, as they did their assembly to honor the two CIF recipients again. Uh, I also had a chance to visit both school, the other two schools on that day and the next day as well. And it has been a smooth start. We have some population problems, which I'll talk about tonight. But other than that, it has gone very well. Uh, last week was a four-day week. We build up two days, four days, and then five days. So last week was a four-day week. Uh, things went well, and now we're into our first full week of school, all five days. Uh, most of us are sitting up and smiling and uh, have a glint in our eyes, so I think we, we're doing well in getting the school year off to a good start. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to say something about the school board retreat? I think you're going you're to say something about it at this point, or do you want me to go ahead first? Uh, okay. Okay. Um, well, Alan... Um, Typed, have you guys seen this yet, or is no. it, I'm the only one who has it? Okay. I have a draft of the notes from our retreat going over the various goals, responsibilities, time frames, et cetera. Unfortunately, my notes that were used to write, used to help write these, have gone missing. So I'm doing the best I can to kind of go over them with my very limited memory bank cells. <laughs> and um, have made some notations for Alan, um, which I'm going to be giving back to him. So, Alan, do you want me to go over this? I think just to give just a, just a brief overview of what we worked on. Okay. So, basically what we did is we met, um, what morning? <laughs> August 21st, the morning of August 21st, um, off-site, and basically reviewed some work that we had started back in June of 2005. And that was discussing the various areas that we as a board um, wanted to see focused on in the next year to two years. And the areas include um, legislative policy making, educational programs, local assessment, personnel and employment, budget finance, um, hiring and evaluating the superintendent, self-governance guidelines, and have I missed anything? I think that's, oh, and communications, somewhere in here is communications. Um, and within each of these, we have various goals. We assign responsibilities to uh, administrators or um, school board committees and try to give them a time frame, whether it was going to be accomplished within a year, two years, or we consider this an ongoing effort throughout the, the life of the school board. And I think that's probably enough information for tonight. Thank you. 
Um, those actual goals are an action item this evening, um, and they were in everybody's packet. Oh, they were. Okay. Um, okay. The very last item in the packet was uh, a copy of to the school board the uh, school board goals for 2006-7 school year, and I we have that done as an action item under new business under um, K. I think we can. I think we can keep it there. I just had a few kind of comments and questions, so it, it shouldn't take too long. Okay. Did anybody else actually review them? Well, I just wanted to, can I, yeah, we speak okay. to the school board retreat? I just want to say, I think that the, one of the real benefits of the school board being able to go off on a retreat is that, you know, so often we're really trying to, to react or, or make decisions up here that we've certainly been given lots of information on, but it's sort of a once a year opportunity for us to kind of think a little bit um, proactively ahead and sort of, you know, envision some of the things that we'd like to do, as well as take time to reflect back on what our past year has been. And I think that's just a really valuable process for our school board to, to be able to do. And so I certainly hope that the board would be able to take the time um, each year to do that. I'm not so sure that the timing, now that election cycles have changed, that the timing is what it really might be to really best benefit the group, and I think that that might be something that that the school board might want to take a look at. Um, you know, it's hard to have new people come on three months after the retreat and all that stuff. So anyway, I just think that that's something that that the group might consider. But I see it as a really valuable and positive process for our group. Thank you, Ann. Alan, uh, did you want to speak regarding Tabor? Tabor, at this point? yes. Uh, and also, Kevin will speak to this as well. Uh, as you know, Tabor is a major issue for this fall, and it is something that will go before the voters in November. Uh, on the local level, there's been some work, which Kevin will talk about in a few minutes. I had the opportunity to go to Augusta last week to listen to presenters around the issue. Basically, the presenters were a senator from uh, Colorado, who spoke to the issues of Tabor in Colorado and what it has done to their state based on legislative uh, information. Uh, we also had a representative of Drummond Woodsum speak, and that is the law firm that is our school law firm talking about the issue as well. And we also had the, chief, uh, the representative from Maine Municipal Association. What they did basically was to go over Tabor, to talk about the language within Tabor, to begin to talk about some of the issues that will result from Tabor as they, as they went through it. Uh, I have materials for you, uh, which, which I will be sending to you, but I think the strongest message they came across with is that the language of Tabor, if passed, is going to take forever, a long, long time to sort out and understand the difference between Tabor as it affects municipal school districts like ours, as opposed to municipal school districts where they vote on their budget, to CSDs and all of the other components of schools. Uh, very strong drive, obviously, from this group to, uh, uh, to set Tabor aside. However, also with a very clear message to all of us that this is an issue that will not die. If this doesn't pass, there will be another one and another one and another one. But what, what the state and what the communities have to decide is what Tabor will do to this state and for this state and what it won't do. And I think those are going to be the issues of the next couple of months. And I, in listening to the people from Colorado, it became very clear that there are people on the national level who appeared there and really pushed them into passing that issue and saying that they will be here as well to do that. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Uh, it's a difficult one as I'm beginning to think about building budget and recognizing the fact that if Tabor passes, I have to look at budget in one way. If Tabor doesn't pass, I have to look at it in another way. I have to look at what the limitations are going to be. Uh, so it's an issue that I think all of you need to take very seriously. You need to read about it in the newspapers. You need to listen to what's going on. The advertising process, I'm sure, will start in the next couple of weeks. You're already beginning to see governor advertisements and senator advertisements and Tabor advertisements in, in favor and oppose will come out also. There is very strong language on each side, one side trying to pass it and one side trying to defeat it. 
So I think the issues will be what is Tabor and what will happen to municipalities, both from the town point of view and from the school point of view. And so I recommend that you pay close attention and uh, get as much information as you can. I think Kevin would like to speak for a few minutes about the meetings that have been held here in Cape Elizabeth uh, every, other, every two weeks. Very briefly. Um, some time ago, the town council um, invited citizens uh, throughout Cape Elizabeth to join the Tabor Committee, Tabor Study Committee. The group that's come together is um, very feisty, and it's quite clear that they are, all of us are pretty set in our opinions of Tabor. Um, we've learned through our twice monthly meetings that there is no point of agreement whatsoever between the pro and anti-Tabor camps. Um, and this has continued. The committee last, last time we met has established some subcommittees to make some determinations on what we as a committee want to deliver to you as the public um, in terms of a unified position. Um, we are also planning on sponsoring, whether at the library or the schools or the community center, uh, debates and panel discussions between the pro and con forces. And finally, we're also looking to satisfy your particular interests, which are yourselves, and what is the impact on the typical resident and what is the impact on, the, um, on Cape Elizabeth. Um, one thing that we have determined is based on the Heritage Foundation's analysis of their own law, um, last year, instead of the 3.9, was it, Ellen, mm -hmm. that we received in funding, we would have received 1.3%. So um, we're beginning to get a very clear picture on what it means for the schools. Um, Rebecca, do you have anything to add? Rebecca would rather not speak. No, I, I just want to clarify um, something that Kevin said about how the, the pro, it, it makes sense obviously that pro-Tabor and anti-Tabor would never have a meeting of the minds, but I think we need to know more specifically than that, that where there is no meeting of the minds extends to the interpretation of the law. That there's almost no point of agreement as to what the wording means. And hence, there is no way of agreeing on what the impact would be. And so it leaves this task force in a really unenviable position of trying to come up with some sort of cohesive, comprehensive view of what Tabor would mean for Cape Elizabeth. In fact, the last time I knew we were speaking of having a side-by-side -side analysis of here would be the pro-Tabor interpretation, and here would be the anti-Tabor interpretation, and just allow people to try to figure it out. So um, it's really quite a daunting task. Um, I actually engaged in a very short financial exercise using a different percentage. Um, I've seen that if, if Tabor was interpreted according to the heritage policy, we actually would have gotten 0.05% increase, which is $91,000 going forward. And I projected going forward how much of an increase we would look at next year with contracted salaries and an inflation rate of 2.75%, and that's $1.1 million increase. So we would have to look to make, that's to cover existing staff and resources. So my message to uh, people who say, well, you're getting an increase in your budget, so therefore you can't say there are cuts, I say, yes, there can be cuts to actual physical resources. Thanks. <laughs> I think that clarified a lot. <laughs> Well, a lot of what I was saying, so. Thank you, all three of you, for, for some of the work that you've been doing on Tabor and uh, for sharing that with uh, the community at this time. Uh, move along to uh, your report, uh, Alan, Thank on you. kindergarten. Yes. Uh, as you know, as a board, we have looked at kindergarten 
both in the spring, during the summer, and as fall started. Uh, we closed the year last year uh, with 116 student, uh, 111 students at uh, Pond Cove in the kindergarten. Uh, as time went on, we saw there were fewer numbers coming in. We were at 103 or 104 students. So during the summer, what the decision was is that we would drop a half a kindergarten, a, a kindergarten teacher. I, I have a hard time referring to them that way because they each teach a half a day of each class. So we dropped that half person. So we were <coughs> six kindergarten teachers. Uh, as the summer has gone on and as we got near the end of the summer, those numbers began to grow. Uh, having been an elementary principal for several years and having been a superintendent of another school system, I also knew it was, I, it was very important to see actually with the physical bodies that appear there. And so we watched uh, the Thursday and Friday after school started. Uh, at that point in time, as of that Friday, we had 109 kindergartners. Uh, as of today, we've had two more entries, so my understanding is of today, we have 111 kindergartners. Uh, that has uh, caused me to do a lot of research. I have a lot of paperwork here as I've gone through some of the issues that I need to look at. I would preface this by saying that I am a firm believer as an educator. Uh, having been in education for many years, is that it is extremely important to keep the numbers of students at the kindergarten, first, and second grade level at reasonable numbers, because those are the years where we begin the actual teaching. Those are the years we want to be absolutely sure they get every bit of instruction in reading, writing, and math that is possible. Because those, th those three years from kindergarten to second grade mean a lot as they go on in grade and where they go from there. With the increased population, uh, and as you will recognize by different uh, information I've passed on to you, because it has been changing so rapidly, is that I have looked at all five grades at Pond Cove and how they look at this point in time. Current kindergarten with six teachers, or two sessions per teacher, uh, means that we would have students, uh, classrooms of 18, 18, 18, and three of 19. Uh, which also translates, if you take it the next step, that each of the kindergarten teachers, and I have a couple of them sitting out there, would tell you that in the run of a day, they work with 37 students in their classrooms. Uh, I, would, I would say to you very clearly, 37 students in a kindergarten classroom, even though they're in two sessions, and knowing their needs, both their physical needs and their educational needs is extremely demanding. So what I, am, what I have looked at is if we went to seven teachers or three full day kindergarten teachers and one half day, we would move to classes of 15 and six of 16, which is a more logical number. I did some research last evening and called several different superintendents who I know. Uh, half day kindergartens are not easy to find in this part of the state. But I also talked to full-time kindergarten teachers and principals and superintendents. And what I found was the average number is anywhere from 13 to 17 in a kindergarten classroom. I talked with uh, one district that I know quite well as far as their full-day kindergartens, and they have 14 kids in each of their kindergarten classes. So that, that caused me some concern and some worry. I then went on to look at the other grades. I look at grade one. Grade one, we have had a drop in population. Uh, last June, we closed with 135 students there. Right now, we have 114 students there. However, again, if you keep in mind that K1 and 2, we need to really keep numbers at a point where direct instruction is clearly done. With seven teachers, we're talking about five classes of 16 and two of 17. If we move to six teachers, it is classes of 18 right straight across the board. At grade two, we have 139 students. We had 145 last year. Those classes are 19 and 20. If we went to six teachers, it's 23 and 24. At grade three, we have 149 third graders. Uh, that is an increase of 22s, uh, to, uh, 12, excuse me, since last year. That means we have seven classes with six of them of 20 and one of 19. Or if we went to six classes, it would be five of 23 and one of 24. Uh, 
excuse me, I reported the wrong one. It would be seven classes of 21 and 22 and six classes of 24 and 25. And at the fourth grade, 137, we currently have 19 and 20, and if it were moved down, it would be 23 and 22. The reason I point this out is I feel very, very strongly, and I'm sure I don't stand alone on that issue, that at the kindergarten, first, and second grade level, we need to keep the numbers so we can ensure that we are getting that initial early childhood instruction that's necessary. We have a reading recovery program. We have an RTI program that is just developing. We have special education. We have early literacy programs there. And we need to ensure that these kids get all of the instruction they need. With that in mind, I looked at several possibilities for kindergarten. I looked at status quo, leaving it as it is. I looked at that, and I know that is not the way we should go. I looked at the possibility of hiring a full-time ed tech. Now remember that a full-time ed tech cannot give direct instruction without being supervised, that they would be more dealing with the paperwork, taking care of all of those pieces, would not give direct instruction, nor would they grade. That could work. But then I looked at going to another half-time kindergarten teacher. I looked at the price. I looked at how much it costs. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this money is flowing easily, is that I'm going to have to go to other parts of the budget, which I'm going to have to ask the board to do with me in order to be able to do this. After a lot of discussion, after a, both a productive and fairly long meeting with the kindergarten teachers and Tom and the guidance counselors and Sue this afternoon and talking about the possibilities, what I am coming to recommend tonight is that we hire a half-time kindergarten teacher, which will take our numbers back to what they were in the spring, which is uh, seven teachers at grades one through four and three and a half teachers at kindergarten. What happened in the spring was, because we could drop that half kindergarten person, we had an opening at one of the other grade levels. That person was qualified and moved into that grade level so that we didn't hire another teacher. Financially, uh, I've had to look at it carefully because there's a balancing act that I have to do with finances. And those finances deal with not only the pay of our teachers and all other staff and their benefits, but it also deals with the fact that we have teachers who in this day and age, those of us who are baby boomers, are looking at retirement. And when a teacher retires, we also have benefits which we pay to them. And so I have to keep track of all of those pieces of the puzzle. But in the long run, I see my job as a superintendent as being the person who looks at the student and what we can do that is best for the student. So therefore, I am coming tonight after a lot of uh, wide awake nights thinking about this, looking at all the data that I have, doing a lot of discussion, and am coming to request that the board consider moving to the contingency fund, which is now at $70,000, taking the money out of the contingency fund to allow me to hire a half-time kindergarten teacher. The price of that hiring uh, for a half-time kindergarten teacher with a BA plus 30 and one years of experience will be $17,200. With single health benefits would be $19,700, and with family health would be $24,000. As opposed to an ed tax, who would cost $17,300, would cost $22,200 for single benefits and $30,000 for family. So financially, it's better to hire the teacher. The process that they go through in actually teaching to the class is a better plan. And it will ensure that our kindergartners, with teachers who know what they're doing, do their plans carefully, and ensure that students are moving along well, will benefit greatly from that plan. So my recommendation tonight, after much uh, soul searching and discussion, is to ask for a half-time kindergarten teacher making three and a half kindergarten teachers at Pond Cove, uh, and that I'd be able to move on that as quickly as possible so that we do not have to uh, offset students after several weeks. Uh, we also today took a look at how we would divide those students. We realize that we have a geographic way which we can do it, which ensures there would be a group of students who get moved who all live in the same neighborhood, 
which is, I think, from the point of view of you that have had kindergarten students, would prefer to have the kids all in the same neighborhood because then they're playmates, they, they work together, they play together, et cetera. And Sue was with us and looked at it, and we can manage that process. Our other issue that I'm always very uh, leery of is daycare because we have, you always have daycare issues. Uh, I do know that the community center's afternoon daycare is absolutely full. I do know that some of these kids have daycare from private citizens. But again, we've looked at the students who we might move and have found that they are students who normally go home at the end of the school day anyway because there is someone there to care for them at that point in time. So that that seemed to play out fairly reasonably too. Please understand there has been no contact with the parents about this. This is only a discussion we have had. Once I get approval, then we'll have to move on those issues uh, as quickly as possible and look at hiring a certified substitute to go into the classroom until I can hire the actual person who is certified to take the position. So, so that's what I'm asking for. Okay. Well, well thank you, Alan, and um, all the members who helped uh, provide the data for the school board on, on this decision. And at this point, I think that we would be looking for a motion to uh, allow a motion, a new motion, uh, during under unfinished business, or new business, excuse me, that would read that we would be, uh, use contingent, allow our superintendent to use contingency funds to hire a half-time kindergarten teacher. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any discussion? Did we make a motion to Vote now or no. vote in the finish? Well, okay. we're, we're adding it to the agenda okay. at this That's, point. That's all we need to do. What, what, what I would ask is this. I know I have uh, guidance counselors and kindergarten teachers and Sue and Tom sitting there and also Becky who will be working with them also. Uh, I don't know if there are specific questions you want to ask uh, while I have those people here because I know some of them need to get home because they have 18 or 19 kids tomorrow morning and again in the afternoon. So I don't know if there's any specific questions you'd like to get answered now. I'll, I'll start off. What was the class size for first grade last year? Last year we had 135 kids in first grade. We now have 114. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So the class sizes were... Um, 18, 19? For, for this year or last, last year? Last year. Last year it would have been uh, 3 of 8, 19 and 4 of 18. Okay. Currently it's, it is 5 of 16 and 2 of 17. Uh, Trish, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I guess it's sort of along the same lines. Um, I know that our guidelines are 18 mm -hmm. in the kindergarten, and I know the genesis of that, because actually I had a child who was in a kindergarten class of 23, Some four of us do, and that what, that's what prompted yeah. the guidelines. Sure. Um, so I'm just curious to know, over the past couple years, this is the first time that we've had a request, uh, are the, were the numbers just by luck of the draw or birth rates lower than the 18 over the past three to five years? Is, is, have we had 18 or 19 over the past couple of years and this year is different? I guess I'm just trying to understand what... It, it is, and you were a, a part of that process years ago when, when we came up with those guidelines. And I think we discussed openly, it depends on people's anxiety level. So we chose 16 to 18 with the provision that when people started to feel the pressure, which is happening right now, we would act on it. I, I think it's been 15, 16, and 17 almost every year. but. I think what Rebecca might have been getting at, how come the low numbers in grade one? This goes back to our um, population projections. We have tracked incoming students past seven, eight, ten years, and we usually get a lot of kids entering grade one and not going to kindergarten. This year, that didn't happen. That would account for the lower size there. I mean, it's good to have low class sizes, and we don't usually get an influx in kindergarten. But it's right, right where it belongs, right at that 
kind of um, tipping point. When it gets up to 110 and 112, that's when we worry. If, it, if we're 120, it's a no-brainer. If it goes down to 100, then it's the other way. So in addition to the numbers being a little lower, I have to report, too, that the curriculum has gotten more crowded over the past five years. There's more to do, and each second in a half-day kindergarten has become more precious. So it, it just, it's not just more kids, there's more to do. So I'm just wondering, uh, I he agree with everything. I guess I'm wondering, we're taking out a contingency for this. Do we relook at, and Rebecca's raised this point, the guidelines, if the curriculum is more crowded in kindergarten, right. and I understand that we have a half day issue, I'm guessing it's more crowded all the way through. It is. Do, what happens if, you know, in January, you get five kids that move into grade three? It, I understand when we're dealing we're with this. We're out of I guess my concern <laughs> is it's sort of a bigger issue. It is. Yeah. Do we relook at the guidelines because so much has changed in the past five years? I mean, I, 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 I would, I would consider. I know Rebecca asked this question the other day. I do think we need to relook at the guidelines. To be honest with you, I also need to look at the fact of of the space that we have available. Uh, the reason I look at kindergarten differently is because, as a kindergarten teacher. They take on a morning group and an afternoon group, which is, fairly, which is large when you put those two together. And although their curriculum is perhaps not as tight as a first or second grade in Pretty what tight. we look at today, it is tight <laughs> from the perspective of a kindergartner. Uh, I believe it or not, I can remember when I was a kindergartner, even though it was 55 years ago, I can remember that. And kindergarten of those days was very different than it is now. And I look at the kindergarten teachers, and when I walk into their classrooms, I expect to see instruction happening there. And that instruction means both the social instruction as far and the academic instruction. And I think those demands are much greater. But I think they're greater at first grade as we introduce new writing programs, enhanced reading and math programs. I think it happens at second grade. Uh, and I am a very firm believer, and I think anyone who's worked with me for any amount of time knows that I feel very strongly at the end of second grade, I want to be sure that every student is reading at grade level or beyond. And I would say to you in Cape Elizabeth, I'm looking at a majority of them reading beyond that. And so it is different. I, and I, I think that's an issue we will need to deal with, not tonight, but we will have to yeah, deal with. Yeah, and just my other two cents were that this has also cropped up at budget time. We, we stopped calling it class size after fifth or sixth grade, and we call it uh, teacher load. And it, it, it's, it's the same situation. And, and it's meant to be a reminder that we have to do something one way or another about it. Um, Alan, yeah. and, and, uh, Elaine. Is this a time to share how we're thinking? Because I'm going to have a question, but in that may be some way I'm, I'm thinking about things. So I don't know if this is the appropriate time to be doing that or not. Shouldn't this conversation be happening at the vote? It should. I, the only reason I'm asking, if there yeah, are questions no, for the understand. people in the audience, I know you've changed procedures before in the meetings when you've had a group here that you want to talk with. So I'm only opening that door, and you can decide. How so to why don't we change the uh, motion to uh, actually voting on his recommendation so we can actually engage in a discussion about his recommendation? Isn't that the motion? Elaine yeah, said it was, was, to, was, was an to, action item. I was trying to have the motion voted on under new business. Yeah, I know. At this time, is, are we allowed to have a, a, a vote during a superintendent's report? I think we've done that in the You've past. We've moved say, votes up to different agenda here, items. So I think times. if we want to do that. Yeah. Okay. If, if yeah, the board would like to proceed with the, with the further discussion, at this time we can take a vote um, after a motion. Well, then I would move again to accept the superintendent's recommendation. Okay. Okay. The thing is, we have another motion. To withdraw. It's withdraw. the same motion. No, it's not. That, that first motion was to vote on it under new business. I think so now what we're proposing motion's is... Motion's withdrawn. All those okay. in favor of withdrawing the motion? Okay. That would be 7-0. Okay. Kevin, new would you like to make a new motion? Yes. <laughs> I, move we adopt, I move we adopt the uh, superintendent's recommendation. Thank you very much. A second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Further discussion? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um. 
I'm really torn by this situation. I think we all know in this room that we are dealing with a super tight budget. We only have $70,000 in contingency. We have no idea what's going to be happening to our energy budget. We have no idea what's going to happen to our retirement budget. Um, so I am hopeful that we can try to find a different way to solve this problem without having to use what little money we have left to f um, react to unexpected financial um, expenses. My question goes to last year, first grade class size was 1819. I did not hear anybody come before us from administration or staff with concerns about the ability to teach cur the curriculum at that class size. I personally had two children being taught in that grade level and did not experience any issues, significant hardship issues. I would ask that we look at the possibility of using one of our first grade teachers to, oh, it's only half time, oh, shoot. I don't know, but somehow make that work. I don't know if you can or not. But I think, but, Rebecca, one of the points, though, that was made was that it's not just the class size, it's the teacher load. So you've got two, so these kindergarten teachers don't just have, they have double. Yeah, I'm saying address the kindergarten problem by utilizing some first grade resources. I don't know if it's possible or not. I totally recognize, if you look at full day kindergarten programs in the other school districts and the surrounding communities, their class loads, their teacher loads are 2018 whatever, and our teacher loads are 37. That is a very clear sign to me that we've got a problem at the kindergarten level. But I also know we have a very clear signs of some financial issues that we're facing, and so I'm hoping somehow we can find a way to solve this without having to use our contingency money. And I'm wondering if the first grade situation this year can provide some sort of relief to the kindergarten situation. And I, I will mention that I looked at that. I had somebody else ask me that question today. And so that's why I went back and did these statistics and looked at what they are. I, I would say to you that if we had the same size class this year as your, your children were in last year, I would still look at keeping seven teachers there. I wouldn't look at dropping it down. I guess the where, I, where I'm looking at the first grade is we have five classes of 16 and two of 17, and I agree. If I took one teacher out, it's 18 of each. But you're right, first of all, they're a full-time teacher, so therefore I would have to assign them something else besides. Is that answering needs of students? I don't know, we'd have to take a look at that. And secondly, do we take advantage of the fact that we have such good class sizes to ensure quality, highest quality teaching at that level? Uh, my issue was with kindergarten, and I'm the first to say that right up front. That was the issue that came to me. I did look at uh, 114 this, morning, this afternoon and looked at the division of the numbers, and, and that's where it is. Uh, but my other concern is, is then you take the cart the other way, we're two weeks into school and we start dividing kids up in a different way, uh, what I'm trying to do is do this without causing a major disruption to the community. I've had no discussions with parents or Tom or anyone about that. It was an issue that came to me late. You can tell from Alan's remarks that I, I think we've look, looked at every angle. and we, we had a discussion about personnel, and I, I think it would be extremely disruptive to the educational system to move a full-time teacher, unless there's someone else in the district, but certainly not, not from grade one. Um, I'm sure every school goes through this at some point. We, we make our best estimate and professional judgment, and we might have low enrollment in a course or so, and I look at it this exactly the same way. To, we need a half-time teacher, and, and to look at grade one now, it's kind of, to me, pushing the bubble around, then we have a big issue there. So I, I agree with Alan. I think it's it's low, but it's good, um, and I strongly support the uh, the use of the contingency fund. I, I consider this at boiler level. I really do. It's a it's a big deal. That's what contingency funds are for. I'm sorry if I could just add one more thing. I'm sorry, Kevin. Uh, it, and that is that we did budget for seven teachers right. Right. at the kindergarten level. It was in the budget. No. 
Yes. Yeah, it did stay in. It stayed in the budget. Just because you move personnel around after the fact does not mean the, your actual expenses have shifted based on what happened in the spring and summer, but the budget there remains for seven kindergarten teachers. Now, I understand that there may, when, when individuals thought that we were only going to need six, some of that money was then kind of held aside for other issues that we're facing as a district. Um, but I, I'm we sorry, did. I, I reacted pretty strongly. For, for me, I mean, as the manager budget at the building level, when we made the decision last spring, it was six. And I didn't consider that, that I could reach out and get that money and go to, and go to seven. That, that's my operational view. That's, I'm sorry, I reacted so strongly, but that was my understanding. And that's, and that's not your fault. That is because we had to realign that money at, the, at that point to take care of some other issues within right. the school system right. at that point, which took our uh, salary account down from a fairly high amount down to less than $23,000 in salary yeah. left after everything is done. So, so Rebecca is right, it was there, but had to be realigned when we cut that position. Kevin, you have a question? Yeah. I, not a question, comment. I, I am inclined, um, and always have been, to keep class sizes lower, particularly at the earlier grades. I think most of you have heard me describe it as early intervention. Um, Regardless of that, that, I rarely make a motion that I'm not prepared to support, and I am in support of uh, Ellen's recommendation. We, are, we have a problem today. We need to solve the problem today. The longer we drag this out, the more disruption is caused for families and for the system, and it's not appropriate. On the other hand, I do not believe we should be looking at changing class sizes now. We need to wait until after Tabor is addressed. Okay, once Tabor is addressed and we've got some cold hard facts in front of us, then we can begin to see how we can re maneuver to address the larger problem, which is too large class sizes in all of our grades or too large um, teacher loads in all of our grades. I mean, we are just so out of proportion um, to what is now considered common. Um, you know, it might have been good back when we originally passed this. I don't believe it's appropriate any longer. But I also recognize absolutely Rebecca's comment on the, uh, on the issue of money. And I think I emailed all of you and said, that's my single biggest concern. But in the meantime, we have a problem we can solve tonight. And I don't think we can um, not address the problem because we think maybe some teachers will retire or we're projecting that fuel costs are going to go up. They're going to happen one way or the other. And if they do happen, they're going to f probably exceed what we have in contingency regardless. So um, while I certainly respect Rebecca's opinion on this matter, I, I, I think we need to have a solution tonight. I, and I feel, I mean, I think that Alan's put a lot of time into this. He's worked with Tom and the kindergarten team, and they've, I'm sure that you have really thoroughly researched all the different options. And I'm not sure that we need to, you know, sort of toss those discussions around you know, anymore at this point. I'm sure we could sort of have the same conversations that have probably already been had at the school level um, and end up coming up with the same thing. So I would like to move on the, on the vote. I'm just going to give one last chance. I think this. Yeah, I think there's problems. some other things to be said maybe, and, and I, I don't know if other people want to speak, but I definitely want to say something. Um, I really appreciate what Rebecca said because I'm sort of where she is at on that, and I'm struggling with this. Um, I respect all the work that Alan has done because he's done a ton of work. I know he has. And um, I, I respect the, his concerns about the class size. And I don't purport to know exactly what the class sizes should be. I do know that our policy was just reviewed back in September of last year. So it's not an old you know, class size number. Um, 
and you know, as Alan's saying, maybe that needs to be reviewed. But I am, like Rebecca, I'm struggling. And I'm struggling because I don't want to take that money out of contingency. Um, I think we're going to need it. And I, I, I hear what Kevin's saying, that we have a problem to address. And I, I recognize that. Um, and, and just trying to come up to speed very quickly today on everything that's gone on and the emails and reading everything. Um, but I, I still am struggling because that money's going to, you know, we can't be assured that we're going to have another mild winter. And I think that we're going to suck up that contingency money just in fuel overruns. Um, and I, I guess I ask, just ask the question, is there any place else that we could find this money for this teacher? I'm not saying don't do this teacher. I'm just, you know, that's the part I'm struggling with is where could you find the money if, if any place. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think the, the situation we are dealing with as the school year starts, and as you contract with people, you have people under contract, and you have agreements that you have made, and so looking at those, I, I'm going to back up for just a minute, and I understand what both of you were saying because uh, Rebecca sent me a question today which we did some work on as far as fuel expenses. And we recognize the fact that right now fuel is dropping in price, but we also recognize that our three-year overview doesn't look at specifically, let's say, a winter where you have a month of below zero temperatures and how much it will cost. So, so I'm very aware of uh, our budget and how tight it is. Uh, I think I warned you about that when we started the budget process this year, how difficult it's going to be. Uh, and so I have, I have looked at probably every possibility I could think of. What I guess I really came down to the point of saying is, I have a kindergarten that I think needs that extra half-time teacher. I think we need to go into budget to do it. I did warn the administrators today, and uh, there are a couple of administrators, three, four administrators there, five administrators there who can, can speak to it, that I said to them, uh, I'm watching this budget very carefully, and I may have to freeze it very early in order to make up some of the money that I'm going to need because of other demands. Uh, we did make some changes. We did hire a half-time uh, guidance counselor at Pond Call. We did it based on all of the information that started last June uh, and all the information I have heard about, the need for uh, the kids at Pond Cove needing that extra services. We did it as a one-year plan to see what happens. Uh, I think we need to stay in that plan. Uh, we have people doing other, other jobs, but most of those were not new funded jobs. They were jobs that were already there. So to find that extra money uh, without disrupting other classrooms and other programs is difficult, to say the least. Uh, I wish I had the magic answer. I, you know, I've watched other school systems. I watched one this fall who has had some real problems because of the issues of, of, of financial needs. And so the only thing that I can offer at this point is I am going to stay very tightly on budget. I'm going to be watching. Uh, I will put a freeze on the minute I feel like we are in a position where I need to claim money from other, other things. But also remember, as we do this, that we did some major cutting this past year as far as supplies and equipment and those things uh, and uh, contracted services. So, so this is what I predicted when I presented the budget this last year in the beginning, is we are into some very tight times. And uh, as a school department whose responsibility is providing the best education we can for students, uh, we first have to look at it from the staffing to teach those students and then look at it from what do we need to take away in order to make that happen. And I, I listen to what Kevin says, which is right. Tabor is going to make some differences for us anyway. Even if we don't have Tabor, we are going to have to take some very serious looks at staffing for another year because of the tightness of everything. It's that, again, that trickle down effect over a period of years, we have now reached that stage where we're, we're on the firing line. I don't have any magic answers. I wish I did. I would give anything. Uh, I've spent many, many hours over the last two weeks dealing with this. And uh, some of the people who work in my office can tell you I've asked question on top of question on top of question to find other possibilities. And I haven't been able to find them. So, so that's where I'm at at this point in time. Might I add a point of information and clarification? <clears throat> very quickly. The purpose of the class size policy was never to carve in stone a class size. Actually, our intent when we passed that was that those 
upper class size numbers, like 18, would be the kickoff point for a full review of the situation. So it wasn't like 18's okay, you know, 18's okay, but 19's not. Um, and that, you know, just a matter of clarification. Now, whether or not the current board interprets it the same way is up to you guys individually, but that is the, the fact behind that policy. Last chance for any other comments or questions. Are we ready to vote? Yeah. All those in favor of the motion? No? Yeah. Seven zero. Thank you for the discussion and all the work Thank that you. went behind it. Alan, we're still on superintendent's report, no. and you wanted to make a report on substitutes. I'm going to do this very briefly. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we have done is I've often talked to the board about the fact that there are certain issues within the school system that I need to tighten up on. One of those issues has been substitutes. Uh, for many years, the records have not been kept at central office and have not necessarily been as complete as they should be, and therefore when we go to hire somebody for long-term subbing, et cetera, checking fingerprint uh, proposals, et cetera, had become more and more difficult. So this year, what we did was is uh, we authored a booklet called Substitutes Informational Booklet, which basically covers what is expected of a substitute and what we're looking for for documentation. We also now have a new application form, which they do. I have asked all substitutes this year to do this. There have been a few who have not been real happy with me on it, but we have done it, so we have updated all information, including their references, et cetera. Uh, that happened at the beginning of school. We met with all the substitutes prior to school opening. Uh, Pauline and Claudia and Arlene were there. We had groups of people to do all of this paperwork, and we did put it together. And uh, so this has made a major change in the record keeping around substitutes, which is to me important because all records should be kept at central office. Uh, as Keith and I have discussed, the next step will be also with coaches and doing the same thing. So we're revising applications, we're revising expectations, and we're updating all files so that they are accurate and current as we move along. So it's important for you to know it, just in case you're on the street and somebody says, I wouldn't do it because there's too much paperwork, that it really is not a lot of paperwork. And there are many of us very kind-hearted souls who will bring people in and sit down and do it with them to get it done. But it is bringing our record keeping up to where it should be. So that's what we've done. So that's what that was all about. Great. Thank you. Um, the last thing on the superintendent's report are the selection of the Celebrate School people. Okay. Uh, you heard me mention earlier on that on our first day on the 29th of August, we had uh, two people here from a group which is doing a project called Celebrating School People. Uh, one of the people you might recognize from uh, new shows in, uh, a few years ago, and that's Patsy Wigan, uh, who worked for Channel 6 and then worked for Public Cable TV, and is now with this group. The other one who was with us that day is Kathleen Alfiero, who is a longtime teacher and has moved into this group as well. What they have done is found a, found a program where this year what they want to do is something that celebrate school people. All too often, school people are the ones who get all the negatives and not many of the positives. And so it was a very strong feeling that we need to do something with that. Part of that is that they are planning on October 18th, celebrating School People Day. The governor is declaring it as a, an official day. And what happens is that representatives from every school system will be selected to go to Augusta and participate in the program. A year from now is what they're looking at is a day to honor uh, school parents and the people who work in the schools and the last year will be students and then there will be one major uh, presentation. Fortunately from some uh, knowing these people very well, they have been very willing to help us in Cape Elizabeth to do some of this to the point that they have offered to also work with us in November, which I found out today, uh, to do a program around our future planning process as well. So this week we did a drawing and selected teachers and support people who will be representing the school system. 
I'm not going to read those names tonight because it's a fairly long list, but I just want you to know it's been done. Uh, I had a call today from the, news, from the Press Herald, and I think this list will appear in the Press Herald in the next day or two. So I just want you to be well aware that it's happening. The only last piece I have to go along with it is the one thing I have not done is to do a selection of board members to go to this. And so uh, in talking with Kathleen and Patsy, uh, I can take two or three board members who would like to go. I know one of the board members is a good friend of uh, one of these people and has been invited to go. And so if any of you are interested, I would be more than happy to put you on the list to represent the school board. I do have a representative from central office. I do have a representative from each of the schools. Uh, and I do have a representative from the superintendent's office, which is me. <laughs> and I didn't have to be drawn on that one. So, <laughs> so, so I, to me, what is important about this is a message that needs to be sent to the, work, the public is that the work we do in schools where people always want to cut us and always say we spend too much is really to look at school people and what they do for the future of America and the work that is done in our classrooms and the work that is done to move students along from kindergarten through grade 12 and on into the adult world is so important and finally there are some people who are willing to take it and make it something that it will be seen across the state of Maine They've also been invited by the state of New York and several other states whose names I've forgotten right now to begin this program in their states as well. So uh, I am extremely pleased that we can participate in the program. Thank you, Alan. At this point, we are um, ready to hear our school report, which tonight will be from Tom Eismeyer and Becky Swift on <coughs> uh, the summer professional development that occurred at Pond Cove this year. Could I just make a uh, point while they're getting ready to go? One of the things that we've talked about as a board is we would like to continue to have monthly reports about what's going on in the schools. We've also very seriously limited the time to keep it no more than 20 minutes and try to keep it 15 minutes if at all possible. And also any reading materials will be passed out beforehand and any uh, PowerPoints, et cetera, will be provided for the television station to do afterwards. Uh, we've done this in the past. We're trying to tighten it up. Uh, we like to have it because it's excellent reporting. We also need to keep a container on it as we look at time. So just so you understand that. Thank you very much. Tom was the first one to volunteer. So he right. got first base. All right, I'll, I'll watch the clock. I, can see I will. Alan's already uh, mentioned that the uh, school opening went very smoothly. I want to reassure you that's the case. But the reason that Pond Cove teacher leader Becky Swift and I are here is to give you an overview of what happens before school starts. So um, I would, I'm going to do kind of the general part. And if you look in your packet, Becky has provided you with an example of some kind of the work we've done. We'll save time. There's no PowerPoint. You don't have to get up, which is really good. You're, I'm sure you're more than well aware that the cycle of the school year is, is more like a fiscal year than, uh, than a calendar year. And at Pond Cove, and I'm sure it's true in the other buildings, every spring, or at least around May, we try to look back and reflect on the year the way you were alluding to the school board workshop. See which goals we accomplished, see what's still left on our plates, and then set some priorities for the following year. Our three major categories for 06 and 07 are culture that supports continuous growth and learning for kids and teachers, curriculum work, district priority, response to intervention, which is a combination of building and district priorities. Within those goals, we identified specific areas that we wanted to work on, such as visiting each other's classrooms more often, focusing our attention on reading comprehension, and viewing where we stand with our assessment practices and our reporting modes. So with that as a guideline, we never have enough time to do all this, but we look forward to the next year and started to designate team time, and faculty meeting time, personal flex time, and building flex time so we can fit all these priorities, we hope, in, into the time available. But the other big chunk of time, which is quite different from doing it during the year, is over the summer. It's a huge part of the equation. So after we have the priorities uh, established and the teams are aware of them, I take in proposals from the team, sometimes they're intergrade, about how to address these priorities and action plans 
and I sort through them, then go back to team leaders, and it's similar to what Alan does, you know, X number of proposals, which ones are the most important, which ones connect best with district priorities, how we get the most out of our time and money, so that everybody in the staff understands, although we'd like to fund everything, uh, sometimes we can't do that. So the proposals go through that process, and Alan has introduced a new system this year with a paper track so that Alan and Sarah and Shari can keep track not just the proposals, but what's going on afterwards. So with that in mind, Becky has, um, Becky will give you kind of a rundown of what we accomplished this summer. Thank you. Well, once the children left in June, um, the work didn't stop. Teachers were still there to continue curriculum work. And the first thing that happened was the literacy team met to review the new DRA 2 reading assessment materials and to begin some planning for a training session with an outside trainer that actually will occur tomorrow on our first early release day. Um, all classroom teachers and the literacy team will be trained to use these updated reading assessment with the students this fall. And this tool helps us to determine a student's reading level by assessing their accuracy, fluency, and comprehension skills. Equally important, it guides us in making instructional decisions about each of those areas for kids. The fourth grade team met um, with literacy teachers and Tom and myself to review current comprehension instruction practices in fourth grade and to review the comprehension toolkit that was piloted last year. After sharing experiences with those materials, the team has made a commitment to begin the year using the toolkit this fall. A general timeline was established, specific lessons were reviewed, and materials were ordered so that we could get the year started off with it. We'll be meeting with the fourth grade team um, again in the next few weeks to review the program and to encourage collegial observations and conversations around that instruction. Also in June, the second grade teachers met to review their science curriculum and to complete the district science template, um, science curriculum template. They reviewed each of the units that they teach to ensure that they aligned with district goals and then prioritized and established objectives for those units. This work will allow them to maximize their instructional time with kids during science time. We're really hopeful, though, that the change in Pluto status doesn't negate any of that work that they did back in June. Um, the kindergarten team and the literacy teacher met to review and fine-tune their phonics instruction as well. The phonics curriculum for kindergarten is extensive and designed for a full-day kindergarten program, so when the team looked to prioritize their lessons, they pretty much came to the conclusion that they couldn't give up anything. Um, really, every lesson in our phonics program for an early reader and writer is crucial. However, they use the time well to allow for common practice conversations and strategies for implementing the program in an already very packed day, as we've discussed. Again in June, the Allied Arts team met to review their current reporting system to parents and to make improvements and revisions to the report card. They were able to get a good start on that and will continue their work this fall so that you'll actually see changes on the report cut in January when it comes out. And then finally, the CIA representatives, the Curriculum Assessment and Instruction Committee representatives from Pond Cove, worked to complete the district template around reading instruction, K through four. Grade level teams had met during the spring to list the expectations for literacy at each grade level, and then the CIA reps used that to compile the information onto the district's new template. That work will again be reviewed this fall with staff. All of those projects happened in June. Once August rolled around, there were some more initiatives that were coming around. And you will find there is um, just a sample in your pack. You may be wondering about that one, and that is at this point. Um, first, representatives from each grade level, the literacy team, special ed, met for two um, days to talk about writing assessment. And those are the materials that you have in front of you. Having worked with our new writing materials now for two years, it was time to look more closely at developing assessment materials that would really help us to guide our K-4 instruction. And to do this, we again worked with those CIA reps to first complete the template on writing instruction. And that's the first page that you have in front of you. The template really defines the skills that we would expect at the end of each grade level. And so the example you have, I believe, is the first grade. Um, expectation. The skills and behaviors listed are those that we would look for at the end of the year, as I said. Once we had articulated those expectations for each grade level in writing instruction, then it helped us to further develop materials that we'll be using this year to document progress and make teaching decisions. The second and third pages of your handout are um, first grade tools that they will pilot this year. 
And you might notice that they contain the same information just in a different format, and that's really to allow teachers to make their individual decisions about what's the most comfortable record-keeping system for themselves. Um, and again, we'll revisit. It. These are all drafts. We're trying. We'll revisit, get feedback, and see how it's working for us. After those two days of writing assessment work, the, we followed with two days of report card revision work. And it just was a natural flow, having worked so closely on the writing, that we started with the writing report card page to first look at making changes. And we first redesigned the format away from a continuum, which you may, may be familiar with, to a more um, format that's more consistent with the math page. And it really defines grade level expectations of skills. And as I said, we started with a writing page because we had just previous two days worked with that. And again, um, there is a draft there for you to see on the writing page. The reading page we have a good start on, but we did not get to get all of that work um, completed at the end of the, those two days on report card work. And so we will be meeting in the next few weeks to try to finish those revisions and get it to Gary so he can make those changes in the computer so that, again, you can see it in January, hopefully, if all of those revisions happen. The third grade team and a member of the literacy team also met prior to school starting to revisit comprehension work in third grade. And again, they reviewed current practices, and they really worked to incorporate more common instructional strategies and materials into the curriculum and created a timeline for the year. So we have a consistent and um, comprehensive plan for comprehension instruction at third grade. And then finally in August, um, as we've done for many years now, I think it's about eight or so, the reading recovery teachers and several classroom teachers met with our incoming first graders to administer the observation survey literacy assessment. And we've really found this information to be invaluable for first grade teachers to have that information preparing for reading instruction right off at the beginning of the year. And um, with that current data in hand, they're ready to get started with guided reading groups right off. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. You, you can see that's a lot of work, and that's actually what went on inside the building. In addition to that, uh, summer is probably the most convenient time for teachers themselves to go back to school. We did a little inventory of the workshops and courses that people took over the summer, too, and that was also very impressive. You, you know we're doing physics first in the district, and a little bit of physics lessons is with the roller coaster. We frequently refer to schools as a roller coaster ride, but Michael Efron would tell you the energy you expend energy the whole time. There are ups and downs. This is what gets the roller coaster to the top at the beginning of the year. It's it just a, it, it brings momentum behind the scenes and gets, gets people going. We've talked about the crowded curriculum. This makes it a little less crowded and helps us get a grip on it. And it's great for school culture. Anything else? Questions? No, but a comment. Thank you, guys. It's appreciated. Please thank the entire faculty over at your place for all the good work that's going on. Appreciate it. And I think a lot of people at home appreciate knowing that uh, all this work goes on while we're enjoying the summer and our kids are it, having a lazy summer. That we, we've discovered that uh, New Year's Day for teachers is August 1st. They awake with a start on August 1st. <laughs> it's just amazing. Just <laughs> Internal clock, etc. Thank, thank you. How do we do on time? <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. We'll move on to committee reports. Finance Committee, Rebecca. Okay. Uh oh, okay. There it is. Uh, okay. Well, I read to you the minutes, or described for you briefly the minutes from our September 8th meeting. We also had a meeting on August 25th. Um, where we got an update on the laptops where they had been received from the state. Um, the batteries were tested. That was an issue because we had just read about how there was a uh, problem with batteries in the laptops, but everything's fine. Um, let's see. We reviewed the food service program, and the audit year-end balance for the food service program was $1,318. So <laughs> we just made it. It was a good place to be. And the other good news is that um, we were, our, our negative student accounts balance ended the year at its lowest point of uh, 3,149, which is really great. Uh, I imagine a number of those are just people who are going from one year to the next from in the um, Pond Cove Middle School. Um, 
buildings. Uh, let's see. Then and we spent a great deal of time talking about um, increasing the cost of the lunch program and whether that would actually meet our costs this year. We know it would have met the costs last year, um, but we because it was reflective of our costs last year. Whenever they, re they they review what our actual costs are from the previous year to approve your increase in costs. So, um, but Sue Kim says seems to have a really good handle on this, and um, I think we're going to be okay. Um, and it was approved, by the way. I think that's we've got that information in our packet that the lunch cost now is two dollars. Um, Sue is also looking. Is that tonight? For approval um, to begin a breakfast program at the middle school. I don't remember seeing that actually on our action item, so maybe we're not going to be doing that tonight. But she had a test program last year of, of a breakfast program there, and um, with some changes um, in the offerings, uh, she feels very confident that she can um, make a go of this and that it will not lose money. Um, and she will begin or has begun conversations with Pond Cove uh, administration and staff to see if there's a feasibility of a breakfast program at the elementary school. Um, I found it kind of shocking, actually, the, num the stories that I heard about children still today arriving at school without having had breakfast. And she has a genuine concern for those, those children. So um, I really look forward to seeing the actual proposal for a school board vote. We reviewed the fin final monthly energy report. Um, the total energy costs um, were over budget by $118,000 which was the good news because we had originally projected it at $178,000. Uh, we benefited greatly from a warmer than normal winter last year and we are all hoping that we're going to get that again this year. Um, electric controls still are being installed at the high school and there remains some computer programming to be put in place. And Alan was going to be tracking down Phil Coop of Smart Energy to get an update on the effort of bringing alternative energy sources to the schools. I assume that's going to be happening soon. He's going to join us at the next finance committee. Okay, yeah. that's right. I apologize. He is coming to the next finance committee meeting. Um, and that was when Alan also brought to the attention of our committee the soccer booster, which we then had a subsequent meeting. Our next meeting is going to be September 26th. We've changed that. Yes. I'm sorry. We changed that, and I don't know what the new date is. And do we have a new date? I know that we, I am out of town that day. Right. That's why I had requested a change. Right. Uh, hmm. We don't know what the new time and date is. We'll, have to, we'll post it, though. We'll, it will be posted, and we'll add, you can also check it on the website. All right. Any questions? I have a question. So in your discussions of getting back to the lunch program, um, it sounds like that discussion evolved around the Pond Cove and Middle School lunch prices, which we raised to $2. Was there discussion around the high school prices? Go ahead. There was some discussion about it. There have been some changes in prices. And I now have that document, which we'll be taking to the Finance Committee in September when we, when we meet. Okay, Why because my, my personal experience is that the prices went up significantly. And yeah. I understand that some of that is to cover that $200, um, right, over to we had from last year. In looking at it, because you had made that comment to me, and that's right. why I had asked Pauline to get those prices for us, I didn't see a significant change as what you had commented on, and that's why I want to take it to the Finance Committee mm -hmm. so we can take a look at that. And so at that finance that. committee, you'll have comparisons? Of yes. The, that's what the document is that uh, Pauline got from me the other day is a comparison last year to this year mm -hmm. and increases and decreases in them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Since it came up, I, I would add that I've heard some complaints about the pricing as well. Mm -hmm. um, so for yeah. what it's worth. Yeah. And I, I think what I, will, what I will be showing you when you, we do this is we have dropped some foods because of the pricing and how much it costs us. And uh, so therefore, what she's been able to give us is a comparison. I'm going to be the first, first to say to you that we are getting more and more limited as far as food is concerned 
and the prices that we pay for it and trying to keep it at a reasonable price. If you've been watching the newspaper, a lot of school systems are battling this right now. Uh, so uh, what I have is a, is a, I think it's a one or two page document that shows prices, it shows changes, and it shows the discussion of changes that she had. And I think also what we will discuss at this meeting is the fact that there are a number of other districts that actually contribute from their budget to the food service program as a way to artificially keep some of those prices lower, which we don't do here in Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, I'm just thinking in terms of the increase, the percentage increase no, I know. per lunch. Yeah, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Okay. Uh, Anne, if you'd like to speak regarding policy. Uh, the policy committee will be meeting next week for our September meeting, but we did meet twice over the summer. We met on June 27th and we met on August 23rd. Both those meetings we discussed in detail policy IKD, which is the student travel and field trip policy, which we referred to earlier this evening. It seems to be one of those policies that the more time we spend, the more time we need to spend. <laughs> um, so we actually will be looking at that yet again next week. And hopefully we'll have a first reading to come to you in October. Um, one of the other issues we discussed in June was a parent actually made a request to the policy committee to review um, policy IKD, which is our honor roll, which we actually had just reviewed earlier in the year. Um, however, he had some concerns. One of the things that's referred to in that policy is our eight point grading system as opposed to a 10 point, which means for anybody who doesn't realize that, that then an A is basically 100 to um, 93. So what we um, did agree to do is to give him the go-ahead and he's going to take it upon himself to do some research into different school districts um, and the history of some of that, which we thought might be an interesting and informative exercise. So he's going to be coming back to us with some information in October and we'll discuss it again at that point. Um, at some point this fall, we're going to be taking a look at new policies regarding accepting funds, such as C funds. That will be on our agenda coming up in the next month or two. Um, later this evening, we'll be having a first reading of IKE, which is student retention. Um, and that is, oh, and the last thing that we did talk about last month was because, as you know, we've been reviewing our entire policy book. Um, there are a lot of changes, some of them just minor revisions, but some of them really major changes to policies, completely rewriting certain policies. And so we discussed what's the best way to get that information out to the staff. Um, and what we came up with that is going forward, Alan is going to do a monthly email to staff, updating them on things that from here on out will be changes. Um, then at our next meeting, uh, committee members, at our next policy meeting, committee members will be bringing to the table what each thinks is probably the most important policies that we need to get changes out to the staff. And I guess somehow we'll figure out um, how the administrators will communicate that because there's just a lot of changes to keep track of. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Ann. Our communications committee, Rebecca. We haven't met since the beginning of the school year. We tend to meet in October. Okay. Along to personnel committee, Kathy. Um, the personnel committee has not met since over the summer, but I'm trying to put together a, a meeting with the various players that when they're available. Um, we have a few more job descriptions to do, just a few, um, and we are working also on a, a plan for um, performance evaluations that's consistent, and also working on the superintendent's evaluation package. So that's what we'll be working on this fall. Okay, great, thank you. Strategic planning, Trish. Uh, yes, we met yesterday, um, and we talked about the Celebrate School People program, which Alan had alluded to. We also really began planning um, for lack of a better term, a, a community dialogue day, which is sort of the kickoff event for um, re-energizing and revisiting our the district's long-range planning. Um, the future direction plan has been merged into a strategic plan. Some of the key details that we've discussed this to this point um, is the date, I think, which will be November 20th, which is the uh, professional development day. C community members will be invited to participate. For those who can't come that day, there'll be a follow-up evening. 
we sort of began talking about some of the details, additional planning will be done on that. Um, one of the things that had been done, um, Shari Robinson and um, Sarah Simmons and Alan had met, they've worked um, very diligently on this, and they had started to look at the, the focus of the day will be the district's vision statement as well as looking at the six goals which support the vision statement. And to that end, um, they had begun to look at what had been accomplished on the various goals. And prior to that day in the planning process, um, they'd like feedback from the board on their perspectives on those. So you will be getting something in your mailbox. If you could just jot down, this is brainstorming, very um, short thing. And I think that data will be gathered as well. Um, our next meeting is Monday, October 16th, but there will be some planning that's being done um, by sort of a subcommittee of this group in be between now and then. Okay. Thank you. And Kevin, extracurricular? Yes, we've not met yet, um, and some of the efforts that went in uh, prior to our retreat were for naught. Um, we had, I had circulated um, goals for uh, committee input that never arrived at the committee's email because of the uh, email woes, I believe we refer to it. And after three times, uh, I finally opted to uh, start making phone calls. In any event, we will be meeting on September 19th at 3.30 in the afternoon at, uh, in the Jordan Conference Room. Uh, we will be reviewing the goals um, for the committee for the year, and uh, we will begin uh, straightening out the, everyone's needs for a, for a regular meeting time. And finally, we will begin in earnest on the athletic policies. We won't be holding off on them any longer. Um, the kids' turf issue will resolve itself, and when it resolves, um, then we can look at the, the appropriate policies for that. But in the meantime, um, we'll probably begin with the biggest one, which is boosters. Kevin, just on clarification, it's showing here 2.30 on the 19th. Has that been changed to 3.30? That was a uh, typo. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Under un unfinished business, uh, we have an update and approval of summer hiring. What you have in your package, again, is the, su the hiring that has been done for this current school year. Again, in June, you gave me uh, approval to do hiring during the summer without bringing it to the board. However, I need to get it in board minute, minute, so that's why I've sent this along. The list you have, you'll notice that there are some people who have a double asterisk beside them. Those are the people that I've hired during the summer. The ones without the asterisk are the ones who are hired and you approved in the fall. So I'm just going to go through these quickly so they can get into the minutes and be approved. Uh, uh, Pon Cove is Christine Bolsa O'Mara, who will be a halftime librarian. Uh, will be taking half of um, Shari's position while Shari is doing uh, her work with uh, Sarah. The next one is Roberta Bobby Sheckard, who is a halftime social worker. Those are the two ones that were hired this summer at Pon Cove. At middle school, it is on the second page Christina Moniz who is grade A science. Caroline Newton, who is grade five long-term sub teacher uh, while uh, one of our teachers is out on long-term illness. And Pierre uh, Parody, who is grade seven and eight science. At the high school, the new teachers are on the next page and that's Thomas Sheehy, who is a .4 English teacher. Uh, he is .4 because we have a teacher who is working .6 this year and so he's taking her place. In special education, we have Rhonda Downer, who is a .5 educational technician. Uh, Tricia Russo is an educational technician three, and Laurie Sylvester, who is a speech and language uh, pathologist. Again, I'm only doing this so that they can be placed into the minutes to show that they have been shared with you. Great, thank you. Consideration of new business. Um, we have, as item A, consideration of the superintendent's recommendation for athletic fee positions for fall 2006. This is that one, yes. 
Uh, the first one I have is from uh, Scott Labby, middle school coaching positions. Uh, new nominations are Greg McIntyre, assistant tennis. Evan Solander, seventh and eighth grade tennis. Ben Dyer, seventh grade soccer. Megan Greenlaw, eighth grade girls soccer. Uh, excuse me, Ben Dyer was seventh grade boys soccer. And Chris Cantera is seventh grade girls soccer. About um, the, the next one, which are the. You need a motion? Don't you need a motion? I, I just wanted I want to know whether the these were athletic fee positions for fall 2006. We also have another sheet here with the high school. Let me do the high school. High school with, with, okay. with we'll do all the athletic together. Okay. At the high school, Keith Weatherby has given the following coach recommendations: Kelsey Ross, varsity girls soccer assistant; uh, Foy Mayer, assistant football coach; Jonathan Wynn, co golf coach; Ryan Piper, assistant football coach; Gina Rossi. Uh, freshman girls hockey, <coughs> field hockey, and Terry Long, freshman boys soccer. Now, if I could have a motion. I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for athletic fee positions for this fall. Thank you. Second, Kevin. Discussion, questions? All those in favor? Seven, zero. Um, consideration of the superintendent's recommendation for co-curricular fee positions. I have a fairly long list of these from Jeff Shedd. Uh, going down through his math department chair, Elaine Brownell, arts chair, Kristen Thomas and Mary Hart, 50-50 split. Technology chair, Betsy Nilsson. Uh, English, Joel Schroeder. Social studies, Gretchen McNulty. Science chair, Doug Worthley. Special ed chair, Ben Raymond. Foreign language chair, Angela Schipani. Sophomore class advisor, Sean Garat. Junior class advisor, Kerry Apanovich, and should be added to that is also Hannah Jones, who will share that 50-50. Senior class advisor, Courtney Farrell. Book talk, Joyce Bell. Chorus extracurricular, Kristen Thomas. Debate is Matt Clements. Speech is Gretchen McNulty. Debate and speech assistant is Kevin McNulty. Drama performance for the fall is Dick Mullen. Drama performance for the spring is Dick Mullen. Theater class productions is Dick Mullen. Theater management is Dick Mullen. Robotics not yet ready for nomination. Amnesty International, Rachel Guthrie. Jazz band one and jazz band two is Tom Lazat. Jazz band combo one and two is Ralph Norris. Literary magazine is Wynn Phillips. Math team is Roger Rio and Tony Giordani for 50-50 split. Mock trial is Mary Page, and uh, natural helpers, Katie Lisa and Andrea Kayer. Senior transition project coordinators, Dwight Ely and Ted Jordan, 50-50 split. Science club, Sean Garat and jazz band three, Tom Lazar. Can I ask a question? Yes, me too. How come robotics hasn't been filled? Is that Evans? Thing? I have to turn yeah. to Jeff because I, so. I can't answer that. Um, because Evan is actually um, looking at, at having, there was an engineer that I think he mentioned in his thank you speech um, who's been helping the robotics club at the high school for the last year and Evan is actually interested in appointing him to be the robotics club advisor but he has to go through some fingerprinting and applications and that sort of thing before oh. I can appoint him as extracurricular advisor. Okay. So Evan is going to focus his efforts more at the lower school levels. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We also uh, need to do yes, the, I just noticed that. the student assistant team yes. member stipends. I have one from Steve Conley I just noticed in the packet here. Following staff members will receive stipends for the SAT for Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Kim Sturgeon, coordinator, Rick Madden, uh, team member, Ju Julie Salikas, team member, Mary Smaha, team member, Sally Conley, team member, Mary Beth Benoit, team member, and Kristen Cobb, team member replacing Tammy Thatcher. And he says, I'm still looking for a seventh, eighth grade representative at this time. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, Trish. Uh, Trish. I just have a question. Is there no freshman class advisor? Um, there is, I mean, I can, now I just 
If you've got the names, why don't we do them? Oh, oh I just did, there wasn't listed on here. There wasn't a comment. I just was curious to know if there was a position such as that. So, okay, that was my only question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I was just curious. <laughs> okay. Well, if I could have a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendation for these co-curricular fee positions. So moved. Thank you. A second. Thank you, Trish. Any further questions, comments? There being none, all those in favor? 7-0. Consideration of policy IKE, student progress through the grades for first reading. Okay, so what you have in your packet is um, pretty much a completely revised policy. The, the former policy is same, um, same code, but it's called promotion and retention of students. And I'll just quickly, for people who are at home, this, because this might be a policy that's of interest to people watching, the main changes in this are that um, the new policy stresses the importance of communicating with and involving parents in any decision of this sort. Um, another thing that was added is the importance of making a decision or a recommendation as early as possible in the school year. Um, it also um, notes the impact of the main learning results in the local assessment system on any kind of decision of this sort. Um, and it also adds that the final decision, while it's the principal's, is made in uh, clear consultation with the parents. So that's just an outline of the, the basic, basic changes. Okay. Any questions or comments? No, it's fine. I move that we accept the policy IK. Yeah. It's, just, it's a first a, reading. This is a first reading. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. If anyone has any other thoughts at, later on for policy, then we'll, we'll get them to end before uh, the second reading. <laughs> uh, consideration of the negotiated agreement with the Cape Elizabeth Education Association teacher bargaining group. Um, in your packets, you all have a copy of the teacher contract um, and this is the same contract. There's been no um, changes with the exception of that 10 to 12 year change for the master's degree um, plus 30, um, which we, we discussed, I believe, at the board retreat. We discussed that change. Other than that, the contract is the same as that we had approved back in the spring with one addition, which is on the top of the top page of the contract. And it's basically um, an agreement um, between uh, the teachers, education association, and the schools to do an education type of program over the next two years, um, primarily with regard to budgeting and so forth and how that all comes about. And Alan has agreed to conduct those meetings um, on a regular basis so that it's not as um, a tight time frame where as, as we all remember during budget process that a lot of teachers came to the budget meetings and so forth, but it was a very concentrated um, piece of information and for those who hadn't done it before, it was a lot to, to take in. So we're going to spread it out a little bit more and um, try to be a little bit more uh, diligent about the um, education piece. It, did I cover that okay, Alan? Yes, I think so. <laughs> you looked like you were going to say something. No, so. I was just looking at someone down there. I had to get a message, too. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late, so I'm just trying checking okay. my messages. Yeah. So anyway, um, mm -hmm. I would um, like to um, get this contract approved, um, if we could, this evening. Make a motion. Okay. Okay, then I will make a motion that um, we approve the contract as um, written and stated in your packets. I second the motion. Uh, I'd just like to thank the people who worked on this contract uh, so diligently over the, the uh, really the past year. And uh, thank you, Kathy and uh, Alan um, and Rebecca well, <laughs> and Anne. I'm sorry. <laughs> there were a lot of people who did work very hard on it. So uh, thank you. And the teachers included. Um, so at this point. Uh, if we could have uh, all those in favor of accepting this contract. We have 7-0. Thanks again. Consideration and proposal to increase the price of the hot lunch. Um, 
We have we, that letter. Yes, we made a uh, proposal to Walter Beasley, the educational specialist uh, in Augusta, requesting that we change our student lunch rate to $2 for grades one through eight. Uh, the finance committee has seen the documentation, which shows that uh, we needed to do that in order to manage to keep our costs even at this point in time. I, I don't know, uh, Rebecca, if there's anything else you want to add to it, but that's basically what we've done. And so we have asked to do that. We have done it. So again, what I bring this to you for is information uh, at this point in time. So we don't need a vote on this? No. Okay. Hey, we may need just an efficient, because I think- Do you want to? Yeah. Just, yeah. Just okay, yeah, let's go ahead and do it then. I'll make a motion that we, uh, the school board, approve the increase in the student lunch rate to two dollars for grades one through eight. Second. Thank you. Any further questions? All those in favor? Seven zero. Consideration of lease purchase agreement for the school bus, which is included in our packet. I. All you, do you want to discuss it? All you have to do is a summary of it. <laughs> Sorry, he promised me I wouldn't have to do that. Incorporating the language of the document. Yes, well, exactly. Can I just make a motion? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm easy. <laughs> Based on the agenda. Yeah. On the yeah. Agenda. I'd like to make a motion that we, uh, the school board, approve the. I'm sorry. Purchase lease purchase agreement as provided in our board documentation. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion regarding this uh, purchase agreement for school bus? Alan, would you like to add any information for anybody about this? I, th I think you're pointing to something. All I can say is it is for 65000 and it is a new updated school bus, and I'm looking to Pauline. Was there anything else that I need to be sure the board know, knew about it? No, it's a 2007 bus. Or obligated. Which was, which was delivered was. early. Yeah. I think that's what that's you were right. looking for. I just dawned on my ass. <laughs> it's getting late. My mind is and it's And it's a lease. That's so. a lease. No, being no further questions, all those in favor? 7-0. Consideration of a lease purchase agreement for an electric car for the community services. Again, you have this. I don't yep. know whether you want uh, Sue to speak to it. Uh, as far as what it is and then where we're going, where she's going with this. There's one from Sue. Is the finance committee? Oh. Uh, Over the last several years, we've had the opportunity to store a golf cart in our garage under the community center. This golf cart was used at Scarborough Beach during the summer, and because we stored it, we had access to it uh, for both athletics and community services programs from September to, to May. Well, that cart has died a very slow death and has been, um, it's gone. They don't have it, we don't have it. So um, we looked at our needs for fall and I investigated renting a golf cart for our purposes for seven weeks in the fall and it was going to cost $700 and um, these golf cart agencies would prefer not to rent them for insurance reasons, et cetera. So I looked into purchasing one. Um, I knew the athletic department had a great need for one as well, as they had usually have one supervisor to cover all fields during athletic contests um, where trainers need to get occasionally from one field to another. So um, Keith and I talked and decided that we would like to share the cost of purchasing this um, vehicle. And um, it's called a lease purchase, but actually what we're doing is community services is going to put down $1,000 and pay the first year's rental for us, which is another 500. Um, the total cost of the vehicle is $4,995, so, and should last us about 15 years. So I believe it's going to cost athletics Seven fifty or eight hundred a year, totally over a three-year period, and then community services will bear the cost of the rest of it. And as far as I remember, I think we are the last community to finally break down and buy one of these vehicles, which is greatly needed for us to be able to access all fields. 
questions? Uh, how much is it just for this year for athletics? Um, I think $800. <laughs> Community Services has had the good fortune of being the recipient of a grant from the Beach to Beacon um, event and um, we will be getting this grant annually and I plan to use a portion of this to pay the down payment and the costs on our behalf. Okay. Question? Any further questions? Uh, I am embarrassed to even ask this because $800 is not a lot of money. but. Since we're looking at budgets so tightly, do we have to give something up to pay for this? I mean, I, I, as I said, I hate to even ask it. It sounds like a great deal, and I know we need it. I'm not challenging that. It just, well, we can't, we have five-year-old uniforms. I just. No, we, we, uh, no, we need it desperately. Uh, what I do uh, every year with the athletic budget is, is things that we need, I find some way to fund it. <laughs> and I'll do the same thing with this. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Can I have a motion to consider the lease purchase agreement of the golf cart? So moved. All right. A second? Thank you, Trish. We, ask, we have questions. We're all set. All those in favor? It'll be 7 0. Uh, consideration of approval of a technology lease. Uh, Alan, so, this again, this is a lease we do yearly for the technology is for $74,125.68. And uh, uh, again, I need you to bring this to a vote so we can move ahead with that as well. Um, I make a motion that we approve the technology lease in the amount of $74,125.68 as provided in our board packets. So second? Linda? Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Approval to receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 2006-2007 school year. Uh, basically, what, what will you need to do is to approve me receiving those grants and to have those distributed through our school budget. Uh, again, it's a yearly uh, piece you do. Uh, it allows NCLB and other grants that may be available uh, either now or in the future for this year. I should mention, I will add just one thing to that. These are also accounted for separately within our budget so that there is also a, they are part of our audit. I move that we provide uh, approval to Allen to receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 2006-2007 school year. Okay. Second. Trish, any other questions for Allen regarding this? All those in favor? 7-0. Consideration of the proposed field trip for the cross-country team. We've discussed that earlier this evening and saw the letter. We have a motion. So moved. This would be to approve this school field trip for a cross-country team? Yes. Okay. A second? Linda? Any further questions regarding this trip? I just have a comment. I think that we do just need to be aware as we're doing our final review of the field trip policy because there were, would be some changes in this. Were we following the, what we're probably going to propose as a new policy? So I just mm -hmm. want to make people aware of that. Okay. Thank you. At this time, all those in favor of this? 7-0. Also in your packet, item number K, consideration of proposed school board goals for year 2006-2007. Uh, Rebecca spoke a little bit to those, but there are, is an update and uh, some new goals and time frames in there. Uh, at this point, uh, can I have a motion to accept those board goals? So moved. Thank you, Trish. A second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any comments for the, 
this motion? I'm not sure what it is we're approving. I mean, we, we got together and we made some goals for ourselves, but in terms of voting, I'm not sure what it is we're – I'm not sure why we're voting on them, I guess is my question. I, I, I think your question is, is probably an appropriate one in that I think what we're looking at is are these going to be the goals of the board for the next year? And I think what happened last year, not last year, as before I came on board, is you chose these to be the goals that you worked on. I personally don't remember whether you voted on them or not. I don't know if Mary does. Uh, but basically what you're telling, what I need to know is that these are your goals and we are going to publish them on our web page. The thing that concerns me is these goals really are only applicable for the period of time that this group is on the board. Mm -hmm. And so they're not really the goals for the next year uh, because we may have new members and they may say, well, I think we should have this goal or that goal and so forth. So did we vote on them last I thought year? we discussed that. I think we, we talked about that and stuff. the fact that, you know, they're with the new board members coming on midway through the year that, that the goals were a commitment for the, for the school year. I don't think we can do that on behalf of somebody else. Though. No, you can't commit a, a future school board. Um, I, 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 well, we I, had that I'm discussion in, in, at our retreat. You know, I'm inclined to support a vote, though I don't believe a vote is necessary, for three months, or through the swearing in of the new board. I will not vote yay in terms of anything beyond that. I, I think the purpose of this was that in the past when we, we made our goals, we felt that the community needed to know the direction that the school board was taking at that time. And one of the things that we had noted was that um, the town council, as another form of government within Cape Elizabeth, also establishes their goals in June during the same time period for the next year. Now, they have that on their website. If, if we feel as a board that it's reflective of the seven individual school board members, then we need to think about doing this uh, at another time of the year. Uh, but I, I had not heard that during our, our, our retreat at all. But, but at our retreat, we were all actually in agreement to commit to those for we the did. year. We did. Um, we talked about that. We did talk about it. Yeah, we talked about and we acknowledged the fact that there might potentially be new school board members coming on. And we talked about the fact that the town council does this and engages this and approves it. And um, it was not an I, issue at the time. I would add that in the past, we have basically looked at the town council and ignored their precedent in but setting we, precedent for ourselves. And since that, or since that meeting, I don't recall saying anything about this, but it's irrelevant. Tonight, sitting here, I will not vote to accept these goals for more than three months. I just want to point out that we did all commit to it, and we had the discussion at our retreat. I haven't committed to anything until I raise my hand. Okay. Okay. Well, we have a motion. All right, yes, we do. We have a motion to accept this as the school board's goals for the 2006-2007 school year. Is there any more? We, yeah, if you, we can certainly you know, vote the way you want to. At this point, do I have a second? I had a second, second. from Rebecca. I've had a discussion. All those in favor of accepting these school board goals? Four, all those? Not in favor. Three. Before three, to accept the goals as school board goals for year 2006-2007. Consideration of appointment of school board member as a delegate to the MSBA fall conference. Um, this is just something that um, we traditionally have sent someone from the school board. Just as a matter of. Um, of, of reference for those that are thinking about being a delegate. It, it occurs on the second day of the, of the conference, and it does entail two hours of sitting through a meeting and going through the resolutions that they will have and voting on them as a, represent, as a representative. During that time, you would miss some of the conferences. That's the only thing I think you need to be aware of. But um, I know Kevin has served in the past, and I was hoping someone here today would offer to do that again for us. I would just like to note that it's on a no school day. 
So no, it does. It's on a school day. Mm -hmm. it, it provides uh, a particular challenge for those of us who are no. children who will be home. And it is a school day. And it always falls on that. Yeah. Non-school day. It's a there, yeah. it's a teacher day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Th this year it is. It, it, every, it, it seems every year it was. Okay. Yeah. It has. When is it? If um, I don't have a volunteer at this time, I would like you just to think about it. Um, there, we do have the option of not sending a delegate, but uh, until we know who's going to that conference, please get in touch with uh, Alan or myself so that we can register you at the time. Thank you. And then we have a last item. Is that correct? Alan? Yes. Uh, the motion by Kevin. Uh, what I have, and Miriam, check with your language, but it's an item on the, on the soccer, to turn the soccer delegation to the superintendent based on his fact finding. I don't know, Kevin, how you exactly wanted that. Well, the, the exact language was to authorize slash delegate the superintendent oh, to good. dispense the funds based on his continuing investigation of the facts or in, in the, of the matter. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any further discussion? Um, I would just like to make a comment that considering some of the things that we were discussing earlier, that those funds, um, as um, Alan was talking about earlier when we were talking about the half kindergarten teacher and you were talking about, you know, overturning every rock to find some funds, um, I'm not making a suggestion, I'm just making a notation that we are voting on turning some funds over to you and I'm sure you'll use them in the way you think that they should best be used. I'd also just like to comment that I, I think that upon studying this issue and hearing all the sides, I think it's probably would be wise for the board to consider a policy on the accepting of of funds such as Ann had alluded to regarding to SEEF, but also in accepting gifts from booster clubs or other organizations so that the ultimate responsibility for that, whether it be the liability or the replacement, would then be clearly spelled out and we wouldn't have to go through these individual decisions. So that being said, any further comment? All those in favor of this motion? 7-0. Thank you. At this point, is there any public comment? Seeing none, school board agenda requests for our next meeting. Are there any from fellow board members? Announcement of upcoming meetings. We have a strategic planning meeting on Monday, September 11th. Well, that happened yesterday. I'm sorry. Policy committee meeting, Tuesday, September 19th, 12 noon in the William Jordan Conference Room. Student extracurricular committee meeting, Tuesday, September 19th. That was 3.30 uh, in the William Jordan Conference Room. Finance committee meeting will meet Tuesday, September 26th, 12 noon, superintendent's office. That's going to be changed. That's right? going to be changed. Okay, we will post it and we will reschedule that and have that posted. We have a school board workshop. The topic will be testing updates that will be held Tuesday, September 26, 7 p.m. in the high school library. And our next school board business meeting will again be Tuesday, October 10th, 7 p.m. right here in council chambers. And also the, the wellness committee will be meeting on, um, it's the first Tuesday of October. I don't have my calendar right here. I think that's maybe the third. Third, isn't it? Yeah. October third. That'll be at one fifteen. Where? Um, I'm not sure. I think we're going to. Tom was going to try and help me find a space at either Pond Cove or the middle school. Okay. If we could post that, then we'll be all set. As soon as I know the place. Okay. Great. Uh, being any further business, could I have a motion to adjourn? So Thank moved. you, Trish. Second. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you, everybody.